my apologies for the, the latest start. We were ha having some technical difficulties, but we are all here and we are very excited to launch uh, the first edition of the Scarlet Rolls. Um, here with uh, some amazing women, women that I that I love and I respect enormously because they are referencing their fields. And I would love to take this opportunity to, to introduce them to you. And first, let me uh, give you a little bit of feedback um, uh, why we started Scare the Roads. As you know, uh, gender equality and women advancement is uh, the passion of many of us. And one of the things that we uh, think is that we need to actually engage more often and more broadly in these conversations so we can learn from each other, we can spread the word and, and collaborate so we have more women elevating other women. And Scare the Rules is the, the first one of many of the things that we will do together to promote the women uh, advancement. And we choose the name because of two reasons. One is because we want to put a skirt on the rules. We want to rules as women. And the other thing is like a plane of the phrasal, which is basically find a way to get things done without bending. We are broken the rules, just by bending them a little bit. So we can change the rules. So let me introduce you to my colleagues here. Rachel Samren, a EVP of uh, External Relations of Millicom. Rachel is uh, one a extremely well-known reference in the industry. She is communications, government relations, and corporate social responsibility for Millicom at global scale. She is from Sweden, so she can also give us not only a global perspective, but also the perspective of one of the countries that is leading in the world in gender equality. So, Rachel, welcome to, to Scare the Rules. It's a, a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Serena. Delighted to be here. Thank you. And also, let me introduce you to Maria Teresa Arnal Mariate. Mariate is uh, what I call a wonder woman. She has been an entrepreneur, a very successful one. She has been a corporate executive and is currently a corporate executive. She founded her own advertising agency, lead a multinational advertising agency, and is now the managing director of uh, Google in Mexico. So welcome to Scarlet Rose, Mariat. It's also a pleasure to have you here. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. You are always your generous words. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, just reflecting on the reality. But thank you very much. And last but not least, my co-founder and dear friend, Susan Fonseca. Susan is a, a very special person for me. We co-founded She Works and uh, in a uh, with the objective of helping women get back into the workforce with flexible work models. And Susan is also a reference on the field, the founding architect of Singularity University, which is the pillar of innovation in the world. She's also the founder and CEO of Women at the Frontier, an NGO that is focused on providing uh, insights and promoting women that are on the cutting edge of innovation. So very uh, glad to introduce you to, to Scare the Rules and to, to our audience, Susan, and thank you for joining us. Gracias, hermana querida. Hello, everyone. And I'm just following in, in Silvina's very amazing footsteps. So I, I love you too, Silvina. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, ladies. And today we're going to talk about women. Uh, we are women, and we hope that we will engage many men in this conversation. Because, as you know, we are a half the sky, half the, the universe, but unfortunately, as a rules in the workspace were done where women were not part of the workspace, there is a lot of areas of opportunities for us to get a, more engaged into the decision-making table and to be part of um, leading roles at a larger scales, like representing the the size of the market that we that we represent. So I would like to um, discuss with you first, and, and please feel free to uh, jump in into the conversation on what you think, and um, let's start with Rachel, are the leadership attributes that are different from men and women? Why uh, women lead different, and why? what do we have to bring to the table? 
Uh, th thank you, Sabine. I think, well, first of all, we have lots to bring to the table. We have as much to bring to the table as men have. I think that's, you know, that's to me sort of the, the very basic uh, starting point. I think men, men and women are, women are different, right? We're different uh, in our personal environments. We're different in our professional environments. And I think that in itself uh, is an attribute, you know, having diversity of mind, uh, especially if you look at a company like Millicom, we're a consumer focused company. Half our consumers uh, will be women. Uh, we need to think like half our consumers do. We need to understand what their wants are. And I think, you know, that mindset is something, I'm not saying that you need women to always bring the women's mindset, but having diversity of mind, having discussion, having uh, each other challenging the way of thinking. I think it's, it's a well-known concept that has, has not nothing to do or not solely to do with diversity, that the more you have a similar set of individuals in a room, the more groupthink you will get. The more groupthink you get, uh, the more narrow-minded you become and the less you challenge existing uh, concepts. I think, you know, having women in the room or having any kind of, of diversity and, and sort of inclusion where you have different mindsets, different backgrounds, whether that's from an economic strata, whether that's religious, whether that is, you know, gender, will only add to the rich tapestry of, of conversation that you can have. It will only allow for seeing different angles much more. It will allow for a thought process and a discussion process that I genuinely believe will ultimately lead to a more rational and well-balanced decision. So I think, you know, that is just a starting point, taking it from, from the top of the iceberg, just having women in the room in any given situation, any decision-making process is proven by so much research to give a room for a much more rational and usually much more successful ultimately decision-making process, which will be seen in the results that come out. I mean, the statistics shows it. More women in management positions, more women on the board usually results in a more profitable company in, in our sphere. That, that's a fact. Indeed, and one of the important things is that women make 80% of the buying decision, uh, decisions of uh, the world, so diversity is key. But I would like to, to move into a, a related question and, and ask Mariate, uh, how do you think that women from uh, the leadership um, viewpoint are adding value to to the workspace uh, because leadership attributes are usually associated with men strengths like if a woman is uh, aggressive she is a nasty woman and whereas if a man is aggressive he is on point he is uh, uh, assertive so how, how do you think that uh, we can change that and what are the key attributes that women are bringing into the the workspace and men and how we can work together to make a much more diverse and, and blended leadership style as a model for the future. So I, I think you, you touched on, on one word that I would want to repeat that is a blended style. I think that we have been focusing on stereotypes, uh, not necessarily to the best outcome and, uh, and and I want to go back to Rachel's point on diversity I think this is more a diversity conversation that really a gender conversation um, because the, I, I think that the differences I, I, we I don't think that we should be putting you know women and men into just different pockets uh, I think you have many different uh, women you know styles and many different men styles you can certainly generalize certain things but i think again this should be more as to uh bringing different perspectives into a group enriches that group and uh and i think that we need to go back to the way we are even raising children today you know in the sense that there should not be you have to be like this or you have to be like that because you're a man or you're a woman or you're a boy or a girl but basically, you know, what are the traits that everybody should be looking for in a leader, right? We're talking about empathy, we're talking about collaboration, we're talking about ambition, we're talking about vision. And these things should go across the board and should not be gender related. And I think uh, women have proven being as competent as men in, you know, the leadership traits of the 21st century. And, uh, and that's why we should be at the table. 
in, indeed, and you talk about raising our children, so I will talk to Susan as a mom, uh, as I as an expert, and it all starts in childhood on how we educate our kids and uh, what we expect from them and what they are supposed to, to do in, in life. As, as a mom of, of Leo, uh, how do you see the importance of uh, educating uh, boys, in, in your case, and, and girls to, to feel equally uh, enabled, empowered to do whatever they want in, in their life? And what, what are your learnings on, on this regard? How educating boys that uh, view the world in a much more inclusive and diverse uh, way will make a difference in the leadership that we will have tomorrow because at the end of the day it's starting the family always. Yeah, completely. And I think that education is so key and to start early. I just, um, I'm an innovator in residence at the school called Rocky Hill School and they're looking at transforming K through 12 um, to the new world of work and the new skills that children are needed. And actually, I was sitting at a third grade class, and it was the children themselves, the boys and girls, that asked me, what is gender equity? How, what can we do to help the little girls around the world? And it already started so young, where, where little boys were seeing that um, in their own language and parameters. Why can't girls play soccer just like little boys? Why can't girls go to school just like little boys? And it was more about equal opportunities even from when you're young and what they can do um, that is the future generation of start normalizing access um, for everyone and I think that's why education is so key you know we're, we're going into a world where in the next couple of years in the next five to ten years artificial intelligence will be a 47 billion dollar industry um, virtual reality augmented reality a 75 billion dollar industry and these are technologies that are the, the sea of change. And we need women also in these conversations. And right now, like in the US, only 8% of patent holders have a woman as the primary uh, lead in the patent. So there's so much room to grow and opportunities for women to be part of the conversation. And I think education and shared information is so critical to get more women that opportunity to be at the decision-making tables and it does start really early we don't have to wait until later we we need to approach it all at once yes it, it's a very important point i, I read uh, very recently an, an article that reports on studies done in the u.s that little boys and little girls think that they are equally prepared up until the age of six to do anything they want in their life, including computer science. But starting at six years old, the girls feel that they are not so good in math, that they cannot be as good as the boys. So it's, education is, is a key element. I would like to learn a little bit more uh, later on in the conversation, what you are doing uh, with singularity and why singularity is the driving the education on uh, disruptive technologies, exponential technologies, and how it can change the the rules of the game. But let me go back to, to Rachel. And Rachel, and this question is based on uh, your experience uh, from your native country. Wait, what do you think that it makes uh, Scandinavia as a region uh, much better suited to uh, reach the gender equality? And uh, what are the cultural differences? Because you are uh, connected with the wall. So you see Latin America, macho culture, and uh, the US, not also a very matriarchal uh, culture. And how is it different and how we can learn from uh, your region to, to do a better job at driving this, uh, closing this gap? Well, I think, Sabina, first of all, I, I, I am uh, very acutely aware that I've been incredibly fortunate uh, being born Swedish and being brought up, uh, in spite of living also in many other countries, being brought up Swedish. Uh, you know, the conversation about uh, gender diversity and inequality actually really has never really been a conversation in, in my life till at a much later age, uh, because it was always a given that you were equal. And then that is sort of something that I am very lucky to have had with me from my upbringing that perhaps also 
uh, I realize at times when in discussions like this or even in our workplace here means that I don't, uh, you know, I don't feel offended about the conversation, nor do I feel sensitive about it versus the men. Uh, and it's easier, therefore, to actually have a more transparent conversation. So I think that that is one thing that certainly has come with me. But I think also what we need to realize is we talk a lot about Scandinavia as a great example. This didn't happen overnight. Uh, so if we want to follow or try and replicate uh, the Scandinavian model, for lack of better description, we need to be patient uh, because it's not a change that happened overnight. And it's something that actually goes back uh, almost 40, 50 years in terms of societal changes. And I think there are many, many ingredients to the Scandinavian model. It's not only legislation. It's not only a, you know, a mindset. It's actually a combination of factors, social factors, as well as legislative factors, as well as norm and, and transparency. And, and to give a little bit more detail on that, you know, Sweden already in the 70s uh, had various legislation come in that did basic things on paper, like separation of, of income tax for wife and husband. That meant that the wife's income wouldn't go, you know, to the husband necessarily. So already they're creating a level of independence. Development of public child care, incredibly important. So if you combine the taxation, high taxation rates, which is something that we accepted to have in order to have access to child care, which would allow women to participate in a whole different way in the, in the job market because they could actually be out there and know that their children were taken care of. Then, of course, introduction of gender neutral uh, parental leave so that it would be up to the parents to split the parental leave uh, between them. And it's non-transferable. It's not like the man can say, you know what, I'm not going to take it. Here you go. I give my month or two months or three months to you and you take it instead. No, that doesn't work. So that type of legislation started coming in already in the 70s. But that doesn't mean that people change their behavior straight away. And that's what I mean. You know, it needs patience, but I need it needs a combination of societal norms in terms of legislation that allow for us to live our lives where we can contribute both at home as well as in the workplace and then a steady change of the norms and the mindset and a celebration of the diversity a celebration of actually having these women and because of this happening over time you know people have gotten used to it in a different way and now see the value of it so it's not that it hasn't been enforced it has developed over more than a generation and women are now celebrated the same way as men are and i think another important point that comes to that is transparency the societies are incredibly transparent with everything that has to do with individual ownership anyway so i could go online now and get the income tax form of any individual if i wanted to billionaire down to the lowest level. So everything is transparent, which means there's no hiding. For example, if you look at the difference in pay between men and women, there's no hiding in showing numbers of more women in certain positions than you actually have. So it's also a transparent society, and that is not driven by gender rules. That is driven by you know the society itself across every factor. And I think all of these issues combined means that there is a spotlight on it, a positive spotlight on it. There are societal norms that have been created over years because of basic legislation which was set up to begin with to actually contribute more to the economy. So it's really a combination of a free market economy with socialist ideals that this from the outset. Now, today is different and it's a lot about women really driving, promoting other women, looking after them because they want to. But that has only been able to come into force by virtue of the society itself having been structured differently from the outset. Rachel, that's a extremely enlightening, and I think there is a, too much to, to learn from that. I one of the things that that you mentioned that uh, particularly impact me is the the mindset. And women many times say we are our worst, our worst enemy. We yeah. uh, feel not capable. We feel that we are cheating someone. But it's called on high performing women the imposter syndrome that we feel because of uh, magic luck and the universe. It conspiring to help us that we are somewhere and someone will realize that we are not supposed to to be there that we got good luck and it happened to me my first uh, job as a regional executive back 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 in time in compact i didn't spend money for six months thinking that someone will realize that i have no idea what i was doing this will never happen to a guy ever <laughs> So, uh, Mariate, uh, in your experience as an, as an entrepreneur and, and also as a, a corporate executive, how did you uh, feel the um, 
uh, imposter syndrome. How, how did you experience it? On your own experience, but also on women around you, because we get into meetings and we are shy at negotiating our salaries and compensations and how much money we raise. We're always like, please give me 500,000, never more than 500,000, because if not, you will be too aggressive. So how, what was your experience? I would love to learn a little bit more about uh, your own experience. And, and this is one for, for all of you. So let's start with Mariate and uh, share what, what you learn, open heart, like all the, the good things that the girls will hear and, and, and feel very inspired by you. So I, I think I have to go back really, really back in my life to answer that open-hearted because um, I think that stems out that feeling and that the imposter syndrome and the always being not good enough stems out of messages that we get when, you know, we are children. I go back to the children phase again because I do think that it's very important that we start early um, realizing that we, we need to raise strong women. Um, so, you know, I, I look back into, into how I was raised and uh, I was always part of a family that would let me do, you know, so many things and, and gave me many opportunities, especially when that was uh, related to education, you know, and, and being a better person, etc. But But on the other hand, you know, it was also expected of me to be submissive and to be a nice girl. And, you know, these are not girl things and, and girls do this and girls do that. And, um, and I, I always say uh, in, in, in this kind of conversation, that I remember there are many phrases that I have in my head that I, I got repeated one you know many many times over my, my lifetime once was that women have to um ceder how do we say ceder um, let go. yeah we have to let go or we have to be you know we have to women have to let go <laughs> and this is something I struggle with all my life because I didn't want to let go <laughs> you know and I didn't think that I had to let go so uh so for honestly, for a long time, I I, um, I I fight with this, and and the fight was not necessarily on a professional fight. It, um, it's, no, it was really a personal fight. This was happening within you know me, and it was I was facing this in my personal decisions and in my professional decisions. Okay, even even a decision like having children and getting married, uh, by the way, which is expected, right? At least in our culture, um, and I think that uh, it took me a lot of internal work. Uh, through you know help of coaches and and therapists and you know people professional people that really helped me get to a point where I finally understood that I had to stop um, I had to stop trying to fill the expectations of any every uh, you know anyone else and the expectations that I thought were set for me and I had to define who I was what I wanted to do in my life you know and what I wanted to be. And, uh, and once I reached that um, level of awareness and understanding of exactly what is it that I want, all the other conversations were much more easier, you know? And I, I could have um, a conversation about, um, sa you know, salary, raising salary or, you know, a, a hard negotiation or going to a project um with much more confidence on you know really who i am and what am i capable of doing uh, despite whatever is out there and uh but it took me a long long time this was you know years of dealing with my own insecurities and 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 things that i had been hearing and repeating myself este, for a long time and uh and i think that uh, when I, you know, when I talk to women, uh, to women, and I hear about their experiences, this seems to be a common thing, where you know there's a there's a, a divide between what you want and what it's expected, and then you know it takes it it takes a long time for us to level that and then understand that we can really be and do whatever we want. Yeah, and sometimes it's uh, it's just like that. It's like if you want expect and you want to be successful, many times men won't like that, and uh, then there is the expectations of the 
male energy and the women energy in the relationship. So sometimes we have to even play ourselves down <laughs> to be socially acceptable by, by the other gender, especially in the Latin culture. I understand that uh, in Europe it's not uh, so much like like that, but it's, uh, I mean, it's amazing. I think that self-learning and self-awareness is probably the best gift that a person gets when they reach 40, <laughs> or when they're close to reach 40, because you stop caring. You don't give a damn about what other people think, and it's all about you. But uh, talking about that, Susie, I would love to learn from, from your experience and how you how you live that, being a, a woman innovator in a, in a male, uh, a driven world and uh, what was the tipping point for you? When did you just uh, stop caring about what other people thought or if you ever uh, have the opportunity to say that that it was never important uh, for you? I think I think it's important. Um, I think we all care and it's important and as women we're we're nurturing and I think that uh, for, for me that's why I'm so passionate about education because I think to 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 Rachel's comment about transparency and Maria Teresa's comment about self-awareness I think those two are such key drivers for the change that we want to create um, as a society and we're seeing it right now um, a demand and expectation from our communities to have more transparency about salaries uh, across businesses transparency about how dealings are done and we actually want and there's research um, that's coming out about the benefits of creating more competition more uh, workforce loyalty um, better uh, better workplace relationships and an opportunity for the client consumer stakeholder to start seeing an organization not as a faceless entity but as a personal um, organization, when you have transparency. So for me, transparency helps so much this entire conversation of gender equity. And then self-awareness, what we're trying to do both with Singularity University and now um, with Rocky Hill School and, and in education in general is start early by helping boys and girls start to identify what are their personal and unique strengths what are the talents that they really bring to the forefront help them better understand how to maximize those skills connect those skills to their passions and so a lot of education also has to allow room for continued curiosity exploration discovery and as teachers and mentors we have to open the door to allow them to do that because that's how you'll discover not just your passion but where your passion and your skills meets um, an industry demand so that you can create something good um, and use your talents for something good in the world and I think that that's why defining having a better understanding of your own values um, and allowing those to carry you forward for me it's been I I like I like kindness I, I like kindness and respect throughout my personal life I like I like seeing it in my professional life I don't uh, and I can't be somebody I'm not. And in business, even when I've tried to be this more, um, when they they've tried to coach you to be, um, to be to be more effective, be more direct, and 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 um, they're all good good counseling that I that they've been trying to give me. But at the end of the day, I honestly just default to myself, which is how can we have these conversations about money, about salary, about leadership about models of work in a very kind, gentle, um, honest, and genuine way. And, uh, and I think that all goes back to what Maria Teresa was saying is if we can early on in our life start better understanding who we are. Um, I, I'm part of also an organization, FLOR, De Andrea from Argentina that, that you're familiar with Silvina and she's just a wonderful woman and her organization looks at how to bring more women into the C-suite and into the boardrooms and we had a really wonderful discussion earlier this year in one of our workshops about um, these women at the C-level about 
who they are separate from their company what's their personal brand and so I think sometimes as women because of all cultural norms because of how we're brought up and and we feel so responsible for everyone and so nurturing it takes us a long time to get to a point in our life where we give ourselves permission to start looking at who are we just us just as a woman not our company title and not all the social titles but what are our internal values so I think that's why and again I go back to education if we can start early helping our boys and girls whether it's with strength finder Myers-Briggs mentorship um, early on helping them uh, find their their own best version and realize that those versions of yourself change through the journey of your life sometimes you maximize on your communication skills sometimes you maximize on your positivity skills whatever they are it's not a set it's not a set stamp of your brand it's constantly changing and CDB you are like the queen of this you know how to not just reinvent yourself but present yourself um, in a genuine authentic way for people around the world and I think that that's what I want to bring into education is, is both a level of transparency where us as adults also are very open and vulnerable uh, to teach our children that we don't always have all the answers and I that's why I love John Hagel right now as a leading expert of business modeling because he talks about in the past the leader was someone who had all the answers but mm -hmm. in the future a leader is someone who has all the best questions and I think as adults for our children we need to let them know that we don't always have all the answers but we will help them process a great analysis great questions and we want them to drive their own inquiry so I love everything that all of you women are expressing because they really go at the heart of how we can um, how we can just present ourselves from the get-go and how boys can also be part of this because they're they're coming up with a sea change also of who are they in this new world what do they represent they're, the structure of the pattern and their role models are changing as well so I think it's education for all of us really I I really very much like that, what you just said. I use, there's a little echo. Um, so, so the takeaway from here, and we need education, and we need self-awareness, and we need to brand ourselves. So, um, I think that are very all, all of them are important important points to build a much more inclusive society. But as we represent half the universe, we have half the universe of allies and would like to uh, discuss a little bit more as women uh, where do you think we stand because there are communities that are extremely successful at elevating each other support supporting each other doing business with each other promoting and sponsorship sponsoring each other and sometimes we believe and we feel and it happens to me that uh, the best partner not necessarily is a woman to drive the importance of equality, that we are not helping each other enough, that we still feel that we compete with each other. We saw it uh, in many different uh, aspects of society, like from here in the United States uh, in during the elections. Uh, women were not supporting very much uh, each, each other. They were much more concerned about what the world will think, uh, what their parents or brothers or husbands than about their rights and depending on why they need to not be harassed, why they need to be given equal opportunities, why we need transparency, as we said, as transparency is really the new, the new black, to put things uh, out there and discuss them without uh, being at risk of feeling judged or feeling uh, tagged on trained into different or any any categories. So, uh, what do you think, Rachel, as women uh, that we can do to support each other as mentors, as sponsors? Uh, what are your ideas on this subject? I think, Sylvine, I think that, that that question actually has an answer that goes back also to what we just heard, uh, the previous question. Uh, because, and, and I want to just start touching on that, you know, to, to add to what has been said. We all, as women, will have moments where we think, I'm not good enough for this. 
uh, I shouldn't be here, like you said. I've had that. Everyone has those. Uh, the reality is that we are indeed creating that moment for ourselves because we're trying to be too perfect, right? And I, and I think that is where we have to accept we are all in the jobs or in the ventures or the ideas that we're in because we got there for good reasons, right? So at that point, we have to draw the line and say, we're already there. So don't question it. You're already there. You're questioning something that's a given for all the men around you. And I think that is really, really important because if we could allow ourselves to accept that we're there for the good reasons and we can give so much more, we would hopefully also be feeling less insecure and less competitive towards other women. Because I think these two things are tied because the higher up you get, the more senior women you have, or sorry, the, the higher up you get, the more of the senior women are pretty lonely right? That's the reality because they're often one or maybe two out of many. And I think that is where this syndrome kicks in, where they are fearing that because we do not genuinely deep down believe that we deserve to be there, we're afraid that some other women will be picked next and they will knock us off the tree. So these two things are linked. We have to accept that we're all where we're at because we're good at what we do. That's how we get there because we didn't fool anyone. Men are stupid sometimes they don't get you know it's, it's not like we would have been fooling them on the things that they really focus on right that's the one thing that we can't say so that is where we have to accept we're there for a reason and there can be more of us it is not about competition right and, and i think a very important way of taking it to answer your question specifically a lot of women uh feel that they need to be mentored and helped and they, they get, i think actually there's a point to say we're having too much mentorship but not enough sponsorship and those are two different things. Of course, we should mentor and help each other, etc. But sponsorship is really what can drive women in their careers and really can bring them up. And the sponsorship is irrelevant if that's from a woman or from a man. If you find a sponsor, if you have someone who believes in you, it could be your boss, it could be someone that you work with a lot, they can change your career. And that is not based on their gender. So that is more based on you showing them that you perform. Now, as women, we need to be better at sponsoring other other women. That is where we can make a difference. And actually, a very uh, a current example on hand, we yesterday had the whole executive committee of Millicom offsite doing a talent mapping review mm -hmm. because we've done an exercise uh, of all our, all, our, all our leaders to map the talent. And, you know, you would be amazed probably thinking of us as a very Latin-focused, primarily telco that it would be mainly men that we're discussing no we're discussing lots of women and there are tons of talented women out there and that we all want to sponsor i of course have a, a role in saying especially when i can spot talented women and i will and i think it's a question of just pushing the guys to to look for that sponsorship mechanism rather than mentoring them into to, to feeling good about their jobs Thank you, Rachel. And we have many questions coming in from the public and only five minutes to answer them. So I suggest that we can um, answer them very, very quickly. Each one of us, uh, if you feel very strong about the question that you would like to take on, please let us know. But one of the questions that I will start with from the public is uh, what we are doing specifically to promote and to support women. I will take that. I'm trying to work uh, to create a flexible work environment where women don't need to uh, choose between personal life and work, just by f working flexibly and remotely. But I would like to, to pass on to Mariate to, to follow me on, uh, on this answer as well. Very quickly, then Susan and Rachel, and then move on to the other ones. So what, what are we doing to support women? Uh, women? I, I, I guess at Google, we have a very uh, strong stance on this. We have the uh, Women at Group, uh, which is uh, an employee-led initiative within the company that looks at how to promote uh, women within the company, how to better uh, give women you know, the skills that they lack to uh, advance in their career, but that also look at the ecosystem because we are very focused on the ecosystem and you know, not only building on, on the women that work at Google, but making sure that we uh, work on women outside of Google in companies that are related to the ecosystem technology-wise and as well into the uh, girls. Girls are a very strong focus for us uh, everywhere else. And we work with many organizations that basically um, whose mission is to foster technology um, knowledge with, you know, within girls, coding, programming, etc. Uh, and, and I it, with the flexibility thing, I, I think that's, again, it goes back to diversity. I think that's something that uh, 
also, I, I hear he, I hear it here within the company. It's not only women that want to have flex time; it's also men who want to have flex time. And then I'm very happy that I hear that because I I I think that uh, Susan touched on a point that we should not uh, just let it go like that. Which is what's the role of men now? You know, that's something that we really need to review and and make sure that we give men the tools that they need to uh, cope in a, in a diverse and, and you know, gender neutral world. So um, anyway, your, your, certainly your, I, I, your, your platform preaches that and that's why I'm a fan of what you do. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a fan of what you all do and uh, in, in particular Maria Te hace, not in your role in, in Google but in your life in general you have been an amazing mentor and an amazing sponsor as as well because um, from the women's standpoint as entrepreneurs we need mentors but we more even more need sponsors uh, people that believe in us and help us uh, uh, bridge the perception gap that we are doing what we are doing not between pilates and yoga classes just because we are bored but because we actually want to change the world so uh, I, I'll pass on. I have to tell you I take personal pleasure in seeing women blossom it's something that gives me, you know, pleasure. I, 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 when I see women that have so much potential and that when I see them make the leap between the potential and the reality because they just, you know, clicked on their mind, I just want to help. You know, I want to be there. I want to make sure that this, uh, there is so much need in the world for women to get, uh, to realize their potential. And there is so much need uh, in the world. I'm excited to see girls kicking ass, uh, truly. It has it's, it's really empowering. And Susan, you, you lead from uh, Women at the Frontier, uh, many of these efforts to highlight accomplished women. What are you doing as, as a woman and through the organizations that you represent to, to empower other women? Yeah, thank you so much. And, um, and I think, so for me, and, and looking at the studies, like Harvard had a study that just five minutes, just within five minutes of somebody looking, at a visible role model that is empowering and inspiring can change the course of your journey, of your future profession. And so one of the things that we drive with Women at the Frontier, which is a nonprofit, is, is exactly that. It's finding, discovering, and featuring publicly the women that are uh, the science and tech pioneers and disruptors of the future from every country around the world. So we are really focused on sh showcasing visibly examples of these incredible women that will inspire us and that are role models and that are actually transforming the world and and um so right now we have that campaign that cd thank you so much for all your help and and in in in, in sharing this with us but it's we will highlight for 365 days for for a full year one female innovator that is a visionary and pioneer a game changer every day for a full year a different one from around the world and we invite everybody to go to the website and nominate their champion so that we can build and have more examples of women i do think also passing the mic and sharing opportunities and acknowledging people that have helped us so just using examples i have an incredible friend rebecca juan founder of you noodle and rivet ventures and there was an opportunity to speak at the Clinton Global Foundation. They had invited her earlier to speak at the International Development Bank. She couldn't do it, and she put my name uh, as, a, as a potential. And it was because of her generosity, giving up that space for me, that I ended up speaking. And that's where I met you, CDB, at the IDB event. And at that event is where then they invited me to go speak at another forum. And I think it's inviting and each other and um, and and passing our own mic and our own stage opportunity to somebody else. What what both Rachel and Maria Teresa were talking about is is opening up the floor for others. Not feeling there's a scarcity model or a limited model, but instead showing examples of how others have helped us. And then we need to kind of walk the walk. You know, we we also need to open up our resources, our sponsorship opportunity, our networks for other women to have access to these opportunities as well. So I think I think for me that's why, you know, in the things that I do, I like to both show visible, real examples of incredible women. And I also like to always name men and women, others who've helped me along the way as as ex concrete examples of how support can be done 
it's not always this very difficult um, uh, complex thing of helping each other up. It's sometimes something as simple as nominating somebody else in your place. Um, and I know you've done that for me as well, C to be in, in, in venues that, that support you. So I think that that, that will drive also a lot of change. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. And it's a spread the wealth. It's what goes around, comes around, and it's always pays back uh, with great energy and great opportunity to, to do that. So, Rachel, we are just uh, about to close. I would love to have your insight. You are a reference in the, the corporate world and also a, a champion for women empowerment. And I know you are doing a lot at Millicom, but also at the personal level. We would love to, to share a little bit uh, more with all of us. And we will be closing the first edition of Scare the Rose with many pending questions that we will address in the next uh, episode. So, it will help us to be the agenda. So, Rachel, Please well, I think, you know, I, I think at, at Millicom up to, to now, we have been much better at focusing on the external uh, environment and the women there, where we have fantastic initiatives, but because we realize coming to some of the points we've touched on today, education is key. Having women actually have internet access, knowing how to use mobile phones, being able to set up entrepreneurial ventures. That is where we have had most of our focus to date by actually joining programs like Connected Women, where we're committed in all of our operations to close to gender gap in mobile data and mobile money usage where we have training courses for women where we have women communities where we show them how to use the internet how to set up a Facebook page so they can sell their handicrafts really empowering them to become economically independent by being part of, of the uh, mobile ecosystem so we're doing a lot externally internally we haven't been as good uh, and there's some some internal reasons for that where we've been missing uh, the relevant HR partners we're just about to restart uh, that program program shortly and it's something I am very excited about that we hopefully we can finally get it out but we've also decided that we need to start with the really big topics uh, you know gender bias training on that point is something we've started rolling out to actually get people just to open up their mind to think about these issues are we actually biased do people actually understand what this problem is about down to the very deep roots of it that is one side of it and the second part is we've realized we have so many talented women at younger ages but we lose them after they start families right that is where we need to focus for now as well to make sure we bring them back and can help them in that second phase of their career and it's small little things like breastfeeding rooms that we have now made sure we have in all of our operations create a space for women to be able to still actually take care of their children if they want to come back at an early stage give them the support have the conversations with their managers to ensure that those managers actually come up with a career plan that works for them while having family not putting them on a plane you know on Sunday night not scheduling meetings at 7 p.m. in the evening small little things while we're waiting for that bigger program with an HR partnership to really take force is the small little things that can really make a big difference day to day in, in, a, in a woman's career. Well, ladies, I, I can say that today more than ever, I can feel that empowered women empower women. So I'll close for now. I'm very grateful for the opportunity of and the pleasure and the luxury of sharing this uh, first edition of Scare the Rose with you. It was very insightful. We will share some of the key insights and the wisdom that you share very generously with, with all of us uh, in social media. And once again, thank you very, very much. I'm touched, I'm profoundly happy with uh, this uh, initiative and, and even more uh, with counting with you as, as partners on, on this Millicom pool, uh, women at the frontier. Uh, also special thanks for the team that put this together, Felipe, Marie Cruz, Jessica, and the amazing partners that help us spread the wall and share this with many, many of you. And more to come, open to ideas and, and open to uh, more questions that we'll be uh, answering in the next episode. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies. It has been an honor and a pleasure to share with you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.